Well, good morning, folks. Uh, glad to see you all here this morning. Uh, there are one or two notices just draw to your attention. Uh, there's tea and coffee at the end of the service this morning, as usual, and then our evening service at half past six, and then our prayer time uh, following the evening evening service uh, uh, this evening. On Tuesday evening uh, at 7.30, we have literature distribution. Uh, so if, you, if you're able to help with that, please do come and help with that. We'll not be doing it all evening. We'll just be out for an hour or so. That's on Tuesday night at half past seven. And the more the merrier. Uh, and then on Wednesday evening, you remember in your prayers, our English classes, the last the little block of English classes this Wednesday evening. And pray God will bless that. And next Lord's Day morning, Johnny will be taking the morning service as part of his uh, time of placement. And then can I give you a date for your diary? God willing, Ailey's baptism at uh, Pencil Inn at present for the 31st of July uh, at uh, the morning service. Then our call to worship comes in the opening lines of our first psalm of praise, Psalm 86. The psalmist says, Come, sing to the Lord a new song. All the earth sing to the Lord. To the Lord sing, praise his name, saving grace each day proclaim. Psalm 80, sorry, 96a, these opening four verses we sing to God's praise. Come sing to the Lord a new song, all the earth sing to God, we thank you for this invitation that you give to men and women and boys and girls from every nation, from every language, to know you, to be known by you, to serve you and to follow you. Lord, we rejoice in your great love, a love that stretches out across this earth, a love that's not reserved for any one particular group. But as we've been singing, a love that is freely offered to all. So mighty God, we come to worship you today, acknowledging your splendor, acknowledging your majesty, your rule and reign over all things, acknowledging your strength, that you have all might and power and no one can stop you doing all the things that you have planned to do. We bless you, mighty God, for this first day of the week when we reflect and remember week after week that Jesus Christ, your Son, has visited this earth, 
has lived a perfect life, keeping your law in every part, and in great love gave up his life, a ransom for many. We thank you for this first day of the week when your uh, church began to meet after Jesus had risen from the dead. And so we celebrate his resurrection today, rejoicing that there is one way made open that sinners like us could know you as our God and as our Father through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that as we gather to worship you today, that you would draw near to us. Lord, we acknowledge our great need of you. We acknowledge, mighty God, our need of your grace, for we cannot make ourselves right with you ourselves. We acknowledge, Lord, our need of your light, for the things of your truth will be dark to us without your illuminating grace. We acknowledge your need for, our need for your wisdom in our lives. And so we ask that as we hear your word today, that it will come with power and effect into our lives. Meet with us, mighty God, as we meet with you and still our hearts before you and enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We confess our sins, Lord, our many failings, our lack of love for you, our lack of love for others, Forgive us our fretting and our worrying. Forgive us our cross words. Forgive us our anxious uh, uh, thoughts and aches in our hearts. And we ask that as we meet with you today, that our understanding of you will grow and that all would delight to be followers of the living God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be reading in a couple of places just now, a few verses in Matthew chapter 5, and then some verses in the book of Ephesians. And while you're looking those up, I uh, just want to speak to the, the children, indeed all of you. I'm not sure whose torch this is. I found it in the cupboard. I'm not sure where that belongs to us at all. It certainly doesn't belong to me. I'm not sure if that's yours, Daniel. Uh, but it's not one I've ever bought, but it's in my cupboard anyway. And you'll see that there's a bright light in it. And uh, we're going to be thinking about lights today. Uh, this isn't a very powerful light, although you can maybe see it shining in my hand. A little beam of light. Well, we're going to be thinking about how when people come to be followers of Jesus, they're like little beams of light. And uh, if this was very dark in here, with all the windows all tipped up, and I was holding this light. You can see a little beam of light coming from it into the darkness. And Jesus says that when we love him, our lives are like that. They're like a bright light shining out into the darkness as we live for Jesus Christ and as we talk about him and tell others about him. So we're going to be thinking about light today as well as thinking about salt. Listen out for those, those words, salt and light. So first of all, we read God's word uh, in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13 to 16. Just a short portion there and then a, a little bit in Ephesians. This is God's word. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, we read a little there, verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness 
must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, that there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or, or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, before we come to look at our verses this morning, we're, we're going to sing once more, uh, turning now to some words from Psalm 71, the verses Mark 10 to 13. And you'll see in each of these uh, uh, verses that the psalmist was going to do something. In verse 10, he says, I will tell of your righteousness. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to tell people about uh, how to know God. In verse 11, he says, I will proclaim them. I proclaim your word, God. I'll tell other people. In verse 12, he says, and to this day, I do declare. I'll tell it, the wonders that you do. And then verse 13, your strength and might display. God's a God who is making himself known. And he calls his people to make him known. Psalm 71, 10 to 13, we'll stand and sing his press. You
Lord's help. Let's pray. Father, as we come to uh, listen to your words explained and applied to our lives, we ask that you'd help us, help me, Lord, as I try to explain your word, help uh, all we've gathered here to listen to your word today. We pray that you would uh, give us a mind to understand it, and that also, mighty God, that your spirit would take this word and speak to us by it, that we might know you at work in our hearts today. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we've been making our way through Matthew's Gospel, slowing down in this Sermon on the Mount, and then putting the brakes really on in the Beatitudes, just looking sentence at a time. We've now come outside the, the, the Beatitudes themselves uh, today to, to look at a little section that's linked to the Beatitudes, uh, verses 13 to 16. And it's the, the closing little part of this first point, if you like, in our Lord's Sermon. And we'll be taking a little break from Matthew for a little while over the, the summer months, uh, uh, looking at something different for a number of weeks before we come back, God willing, uh, in the autumn to Matthew again. So these three verses that we look at today, they're there, you have them in your order of service, verses 13 to 16. And as we look at these words, we'll hear what the Lord Jesus' assessment of the world is. Lots of different ways we might describe the word, but we're going to hear how Jesus assesses the world. And we're going to hear how the Lord Jesus Christ uh, give, gave to his church a very important way of spreading his message. Uh, the last time uh, when we were looking at Matthew's uh, gospel, we, we saw in verses 11 to 12 the response of the world to the true Christian, as we've seen described from verse 2 to verse uh, 10. We saw those wonderful uh, characteristics of someone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we saw how the world responds. The world shuns such a person. At times they're physically and literally persecuted, other times ignored. Maybe spoken lies off. That's the world's response very often to the light of Christianity. So what's the Christian to do? Jesus has told his disciples, it's going to be difficult. You'll be persecuted. They'll say all sorts of things against you falsely for my sake. What's the Christian to do? Well, we might be tempted to retreat. We might be tempted to say, well, it's a big bad world there. I'm just going to live in my little Christian gathering and not have any contact with the world. Well, Jesus in these verses is showing his disciples that's not what he would have for us. And he uses two very simple pictures. A picture of salt and the picture of light to show the followers of Jesus Christ that he was speaking to that day their great value in the world and the great purpose that God had for them in the world. And as we look at these three verses today, we're, we're going to note three things. First of all, there's something by way of implication. In other words, there's something under Jesus' words here. Then we're going to see, some, see a great encouragement. And then finally, we're going to think about a challenge. So, First of all then, let's think about our worlds. That's the first thing we're going to think about, our worlds. Well, how would you describe it? Well, if you've got a garden or walk past someone's garden and all the roses are coming out and all the flowers are coming out or you've had a walk recent in the park in the morning and you've heard the birds singing, you would say, it's a beautiful world. And it is. Uh, Psalmist tells us in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. It's a beautiful world. And in this world, there are seven billion of us. Seven billion at the very apex of God's creation. Seven, million, uh, seven billion amazing creatures like you. 
made in the image of God with gifts and abilities and strengths. And the psalmist says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's much that is good and beautiful in our world. It, it's good, isn't it, that we can come here today and we have, uh, we have no thought of being troubled because we've come to church. It's, it's good. Uh, we've got hospitals to go to if we're unwell. Uh, we've got uh, schools for, for children to learn. Uh, we've got roads to travel on. It, it's good. We've got a government and we, we might complain, but we've got a government and, and it has laws and by and large the uh, the laws of the land uh, uh, are keep a measure of peace and calm, uh, and it, it's, it's good. Much to thank God for. But we also know that that's not the full picture of our world. There's much that's broken. There's sorrow and sadness. There's pain. There's hurt. You might have some of those things in your life today for yourself. And the Lord Jesus, when he used these two pictures here to speak to his disciples about their place in the world, he was saying something about the world. When he, when he said that his followers are, are salt and light, there's a, there's a great implication behind his words about how our world is. If you think of salt, it wasn't for your chips in Bible times. It was used to preserve things. It stopped, it, it stopped decay. It, it slowed it down at least. So when Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, it was a sobering truth about the reality of the rottenness of the world. That there was decay in the world. That there was death. So it was speaking a great deal of what was wrong. And of course, to say that there's a rottenness in the world isn't a truth that settles well in the world. Rottenness? Decay in our world? Uh, we've been told as uh, human beings since the days of Darwin and even just before it, that uh, as human beings, we're, we're on the way up. We're, we're, we're getting better. There's a, there's a rise in, in our evolving. Uh, the world's been told that one well, man's getting better all the time, and it's just a matter of time, and wars will cease, and disease will disappear, and there'll be harmony by and large, and, and death, will, it'll be pushed back to. Really? Jesus said that in this world there is the rottenness of sin that affects everything. Take a little whiff tomorrow of the news whether you're scrolling on your phone or belong to one of the dinosaurs that buy a newspaper. Uh, just take a look. You'll smell the rottenness. Sin has got into everything. Uh, sin has spread its effect and there's decay in people's lives and decline in society and death. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a stench. That's not how God made his world. But as soon as sin came into the world, the decay and the rot of sin began to spread. Well, someone might say, well, well what about all the, the lovely people that we meet? And they're kind and sweet. Well, we're thankful to God for his, his grace that, that curbs the, the effect of sinfulness. But every human being, there's a rottenness in us all. Uh, no, no one would want their inner thoughts exposed. Or take the other picture that the Lord has, the picture of light. You are the light of the world. Jesus said to his disciples, there's an implication again. And now the implication is, you're going out into a world, and it's full of darkness. And again, it's not a message that our world likes and would contradict. 
our world would say, oh, we've long come through the years of enlightenment. Uh, we don't need a God anymore. We've outgrown all of that. We're enlightened people. We can do so much now. All we need in situations, the world says, is some more education, a little bit more light, uh, some more finances, uh, a plan of government, and whatever's difficult and dark, will that'll all disappear. Really? The world full of light? Not the light of the Bible. Not the light of knowing God or seeking God. And our world is a world that's darkening more and more as God's ways are abandoned. Well, that's the first point, our world. And if that was the end of this message, it would be a counsel of despair. But it's not. Because a Christian life, as we've been seeing, is a life about a, a, a thorough well-being, a blessedness. It's about having our sins removed. It's about having light come. It's about knowing God and being right with God. And so we want to see secondly in our verses today, our influence. Our influence. In this sermon, you remember that the Lord Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Speaking to those men who would be apostles and carry the gospel out into the world, those, and you remember that one of them wasn't a, a true follower of Jesus Christ, and that would appear, but speaking to those 11, and he was also speaking to others who were wanting to find out a little bit, but they weren't yet his followers, and there were others who said they were his followers, and after a little while they'll disappear and show that they were never his followers. And I imagine the Lord Jesus now when he comes to these, these words in verses 13 to 16, looking especially at those little group of men who had truly come to know him and whom he would send out into the world with the gospel. Think of those men. They were just very ordinary men. Scriptures tell us that there were none of them who were schooled. None of them had any uh, education. They were... They were poor peasants of Galilee. They were fishermen, many of them. They were, they were the despised of the world. They, they were the low life, these 11 men. But to them, the Lord Jesus said, You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And if you look very carefully, you'll see this wasn't something that was a promise. He wasn't saying to them, you will be the salt of the earth. You will be the light of the world. He says to them, you are. You. He says, you, my followers, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And the, the you there in these statements, it, it's emphatic. It's as if he's saying to them, you nobodies in the, light, in the eyes of the world. You're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You, you people and nobody else. Because Jesus Christ had changed their lives. The rot of their sin that had made them guilty before God had been pardoned because of what he was about to do on the cross. The darkness of sin in their lives, its guilt and its power, had been, been sorted by what Jesus was on the way to do on the cross. And he's saying to these men, you're, you're different. There's darkness out there and there's, there's decay out there. But you, you're the salt of the earth. The light of the world. You imagine some of these men thinking about this. Peter thinking about it. And Jesus saying to him, you Peter, you stumbling Peter. You're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You, James and John, sons of thunder, I expect they had something of their, fire, their father's feistiness. You, you're the light of, 
light of the world, the salt of the earth. And just, just think of these pictures again uh, for a little moment. Let's take them as we think of the, uh, the Christian's influence. You are the salt of the earth. Uh, that's a little phrase, actually. Actually, it comes into our Christian language, speaking of someone as the salt of the earth. It's not really how the Bible is speaking of it here. We talk about someone, oh, they're the salt of the earth. They're really good. They're really helpful. It's not quite what Jesus is saying here. In Bible times, you had no freezer. You had no ice box. And the only way to keep a little bit of meat for later on was to dry it all out and to take some salt and rub it in. That would hold back the decay. And that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. You're the salt of the earth. Your living in the world will have, a, have an effect on the world. It'll hold back the rot. Maybe you've experienced that as a Christian. Uh, I'm sure it's not just because I'm a pastor, but uh, uh, I've had lots of occasions where I'm in company with with, with Christians and they come out with a mouthful of expletives and then they say, oh sorry pastor as if it was to me that they need it was God they need to look to for forgiveness but maybe you've had that said to you as well that somebody realised you're a Christian and they've said something and they, they apologise and maybe they, they restrain their, their language a little that's something of the saltiness that Jesus Christ is speaking about or, or as you go about your work in your workplace and you're diligent at that, it has an impact. It doesn't necessarily bring persecution, as I mentioned last week, but sometimes it can be the very thing that stirs others up to be more diligent. And Jesus was saying to his disciples, your life matters. He's saying to, that, to you today, if you're a Christian, wherever he's put you, your life matters. You are the salt of the earth. And he's using you, holding back the decay, as it were, of society, that the light of the gospel will shine out. And take that other picture he uses, you are the light of the world. He was saying to his disciples, your life makes a difference right now. And again, we don't quite get this picture because... We live in Belfast, and even when you go to bed at night, well, there's not much night at the minute, but even in the winter's night, it's never dark. There's always a light on somewhere, the street light shining in through your curtains. But if you'd lived in Bible times, having that little, uh, it's like a little jug with oil in it and a wick out one side of it, having that light was really important, and it it just made the darkness disappear and it infiltrated the darkness and removed it. And that's what Jesus was saying to these men. He was saying to them, I've come into your life. The one who's the light of the world. And he's taken away the sins of his people so that there's a, there's a light from them. Not a literal light, there's no uh, glow, as it were, comes off us. But it's, it's light in the darkness. If you think of what we use lights for, um, if you have a car, there's on your dashboard there'll be a light that comes on, a warning light. Engine malfunction, that's going to cost you a fortune getting that fixed, but it's a warning. Stop. You've got to change. You've got to do something about this. Or you think of the lights that if you've been on the airplane and are coming into land at Aldergrove or a city airport and thankfully the, the pilot can see the lights were uh, to guide him into a safe place. Jesus saying, that's your life, Christian. Your life is, it's like a warning light flashing. Uh, and it's saying there's a, there's a God to follow and you need to follow him. Your, your life's that light guiding people to, to the Savior, Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. He was saying to these nobodies, your life counts for something. It has meaning and it has purpose. You know, sometimes a Christian can think, well, what can I do for God? Jesus is saying to his disciples, being one of my followers, having these 
characteristics that we've been looking at growing in your life. Uh, 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 being poor in spirit and mourning over sin and being meek and hungering and thirsting for righteousness and being pure in heart and peacemakers. Jesus is saying, as that's growing and developing in you, you'll be a light. You are the light of the world. In your family, maybe you're the only Christian. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Or in your workplace, or, or amongst your friends at school, or wherever it is. If you're a follower of Christ, Jesus Christ has actually set you there to be a light. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's your influence, Christian. But the third thing that we want to notice is our responsibility. Apparently one of the big things in past years is influencers on Instagram or whatever it might be, whatever social media it is, if you've got some product you want to sell, you get some of these influencers, I have no idea who any of them are, but uh, I've heard of them, and they'll wear your watch or wear your perfume, whatever it is, and they'll just influence all the, the tens of thousands or hundreds of uh, thousands of followers they are. Uh, how pathetic. With a Christian, you're different. You're the influencers of the world. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You're the real influencers. And with that privilege comes responsibility. Think of these pictures again. Think of the salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste or its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Well, I wasn't ever top of the class in science. Usually down about the bottom of the class. But I think I do remember that salt is a very stable compound, sodium chloride. It is very stable. It actually can't lose its saltiness. Uh, salt, salt, and it'll always be salt and can't lose it. So what is Jesus doing here? Well, Jesus knew everything. He knew all about science before we studied it, and he's not making a scientific statement. He's making an illustration that fitted with the times because the salt that people had in those days wasn't the same as a little nice uh, container of salt that sits in your dining room table or in the cupboard, depending on how healthy you are. Uh, it's, it wasn't like that. It was, a, it was a mixed compound. There was real salt in it and there was lots of other stuff in it as well. So it was possible for the real salt to be leached out of it and for you to be left with this other powdery substance that Jesus said, and it was obviously something that was well known, that it was no longer fit for anything except to be made for a fill for the pathways. So Jesus was saying to his disciples, You are my salt. And you're to be out there in the world. You're not to hide and he's saying to his disciples, don't let any of the characteristics that, that I've been speaking about in the Beatitudes, don't let those things be leached from your life. Don't let them dampen down. Don't lose your saltiness. It's the challenge for the Christian uh, to be making sure our saltiness is increasing. As we're growing in grace and becoming more like Jesus Christ. Don't lose your saltiness. Keep growing as a Christian. And in both of these pictures as well, Jesus is saying, you're to be out in the world. You're different from the world, but you're not to be distant from the world. Salt's no good and it's salt shaker. Your life, Christian, is not to be closeted away in little holy huddles here and there. 
Your life is to be out in the world, to be salt. And don't lose your saltiness. What of you this morning? Is there something of your saltiness that's been leached? Sometimes to be living in the world and not growing in our Christian faith, we, we lose something of that saltiness. Or think of the light. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. He says, you're the light of the world. You're like a city on a hill. It can't be hidden. Cities on a hill in those days had light shining out from it. You just are there like a beacon, he said. And you're not to hide. You're not to put your light under a basket. It's, it's a ridiculous picture he's painting here and speaking of here. He's showing the folly of it. Don't hide away. But be set up in the stand, as it were, that it might give out its light. And he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. What did he mean by that? What, what does that actually mean? Let your light shine. Well, does that mean you need a loud healer and go out onto the street shouting out a message? Does it mean you get a big badge? I love Jesus. No. If you look a little further in our verse, Jesus explains it when he says that they may see your good works. That's how Christians shine out the light, that they may see, that the world around might see your good works. We're not saved by good works. The Bible tells us we're saved for good works. In the Greek language there are different words for good and the one that's chosen here as Matthew records these words is the word that means beautiful that they may see your beautiful life that they may see this blessed life that you've been given by God that they might see the change and the and the distinctiveness He's saying, let my love shine out. Let my mercy shine out. Let my patience shine out. Let them see your good works. Let them see what I've done in you. Not that we would be attracting people to ourselves, but that we would be making people look to Jesus Christ and to our Heavenly Father, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Jesus is saying to, to his church here, these men who are the representatives of his church, here's what I want you to do. Go out and live in the world and let my light shine out. These men would be called to preach and teach, but they would be the beginning of, a, of the New Testament church of, of thousands of men and women and boys and girls who wouldn't preach and teach, but they would go out and be lights and shine out for the glory of God and he says, there'll be fruit from it. They'll give glory to your Father. In other words, these lives are going to be changed and they're going to come to know God. And the challenge for the Christian then is, what about your light? Is it shining out? I used to have a car and it was so old that the it's not glass in the headlights, I can't remember what it was, some sort of perspex stuff in the headlights. And it was so old that they'd become opaque, a, a, a real deep level of scum on the outside. You washed it, it didn't come off. And you had to take a thing called T-cut, really strong thing for polishing things. And bit by bit you could get the opaqueness away and the beams of light it would be so much brighter. Is there something in your life, Christian, that's making the light that should be shining from you a little bit dimmer? It can be our living like the world. It 
can be our watching what the world watches, living like the world lives, and the light is dull. But what an encouragement for these believers. They'll see the beautiful life, the life that Christ has put in you, and they'll give glory to your Father in heaven. Heard of a young woman recently, and a young woman, she was busy in doing her work for the Lord. It wasn't a, a Christian message that she was bringing. But some noticed something different about her. It was the enthusiasm that she did her service, that her work wasn't just done for herself, but it was done for God. And two people had a conversation. One turned and said to the other, Does she love Jesus? And the other person replied, Yes, I know she does, because she goes to my church. Well, if you weren't a Christian watching that young Christian, wouldn't you think, that's a beautiful life. Wouldn't you think, that's the church that I would like to go to, to hear about this person that has so transformed her life. And that's what Jesus Christ gives you and I the privileged Christian to be. Salt and light. Maybe you listen this morning and you're not yet a Christian. Well, one of the things that God sometimes does in the lives of men and women is to put these little lights around about us so that we can see what the Christian life is like so we can see what Jesus Christ does for people. And that's the kindness of God. That's him saying, you too can taste and see that God is good. Maybe you've noticed in Christians that they're a bit different. And every Christian would say, that's not anything to do with me. Because I'm just like the moon. I don't have any light of myself, the Christian says. I'm just reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And he's come into my life and he's taken away the darkness of my sin by what he, was what he did on the cross. And every light bearer would say, if you'll come to him and trust him as your saviour and follow him, you too will be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Amen. Well, let's sing praise to God as we conclude our worship. As we sing from Psalm 66, the, these four verses. Shout to God with joy, all nations. Don't you just love these words in, in our Psalms? Well, the God that we worship is the God that wants all the nations, no matter what country people are from, to come to know Him as, our, as their God. Shout to God with joy, all nations. Psalm 66a, 1-4. Shout to God with joy, all nations, sing the splendor of His name. Make His praise resound with glory, awesome are Your works proclaim. Say to God's Lord, praise Your power. Jesus Christ, 
the love of God, and the fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen.